When the detectives arrived at the scene, they came face to face with a crime scene so brutal. After she never showed up to pick her young daughters up from daycare. At the time, Cannon was serving prison time. You shoot Officer Shaw. You, say the officer you want to say anything to the family? Clearly the decisive element and other ones, it was just a major element in the thinking of the people. Time for a separate assault and escaped while taking part in a prison work program. They also say there's no documentation that Gilchrist touched this. We reached out to Julie's family, but we did not hear back. For clemency, saying Cannon was not allowed a fair trial back in 1995. <laughs> He was convicted of killing his cousin and his cousin's fiance in 2000. Comes after a new after I, after I got arrested and I came to prison, their their name was you know synonymous for for being involved. Number 15, John Eichinger. In the quiet neighborhood of Somers Point, New Jersey, a real life monster lurked in disguise. John Charles Eichinger, a seemingly ordinary man, led a double life that would haunt the community for years. Between 1999 and 2005, he handed out Halloween candy to unsuspecting children, dressed as the fictional killer from the movie Scream. Little did they know the clothes he wore and the knife he carried had been used in a real slaying. Eichinger's dark story began with his friendship with Jennifer Still. They shared a love for the game Dungeons & Dragons, but Eichinger desired more than friendship. On a fateful day in July of 1999, he gathered the courage to confess his feelings to Jennifer, only to face rejection. Enraged by her refusal, Eichinger unleashed a brutal attack, knifing Jennifer multiple times until she succumbed to her injuries. The slaying shocked Jennifer's family and friends who were left devastated and bewildered. Eichinger managed to evade suspicion for six long years until another woman, Heather Greaves, became the object of his dangerous infatuation. Eichinger confronted Heather, expressing his love and demanding she end her current relationship. When Heather rejected him, history repeated itself. In a fit of rage, Eichinger took Heather's life and tragically slayed her three-year-old daughter Avery and her sister Lisa to eliminate witnesses. The heinous crimes came to light when Eichinger was seen leaving the crime scene, blood dripping from his arm. His arrest led to a shocking confession. He not only admitted to the Greaves' family slayings, but also revealed his horrifying annual ritual. Eichinger had kept the slaying weapon, his blood-stained clothes and rubber gloves from Jennifer slaying, using them as macabre props for his Halloween costume. Clad in the scream mask, he would hand out candy to unsuspecting children, carrying the same knife that had taken innocent lives. In 2005, Eichinger was given capital punishment for the Greaves' family slayings, and received a life sentence for Jennifer's killing. Despite his defense claims of mental disturbance and dependency issues, the court saw through his attempt to avoid the consequences of his actions. Eichinger's meticulously planned crimes, lack of a history of mental health treatment, and the brutal nature of his acts outweighed any mitigating factors. Since his sentencing, Eichinger has exhausted all appeals, failing to overturn his fate. When the detectives arrived at the scene, they came face to face with a crime scene so brutal there was an actual moral panic surrounding the role-playing game, questioning its links to witchcraft and sorcery. Says there are 28 deaths related to Dungeons and Dragons in the last five years. In some of those, it was clearly the decisive element, and other ones, it was just a major element in the thinking of the people. Let's take it a step further, playing a character who brings them the power in a game they couldn't. Number fourteen. Jermaine Cannon. Jermaine Cannon's story is one filled with violence and tragedy. In 1995, he faced ending for the brutal slaying of Sharonda White Clark, a young mother of two in her Tulsa apartment. Cannon had escaped from an Oklahoma Department of Corrections work center before carrying out the heinous act. Clark was found lifeless with three knife wounds in her neck, her cardioid artery severed and jugular vein cut. Prior to her demise, Cannon had been staying with her at Normandy Apartments. This was not the first violent crime committed by Cannon. In 1990, he had attacked an 18-year-old woman who rejected his advances, leaving her permanently disfigured and nearly killed. He had a history of violence towards girlfriends and ex-girlfriends. Cannon had been serving a 15-year sentence for his previous attack when he stole a pickup truck from the Walter school system and ended up in Tulsa. After Clark's body was discovered, authorities captured Cannon in Flint, Michigan. His case drew criticism from former Governor Frank Keating, 
who condemned the correction department's classification system that allowed Cannon to serve his sentence in a community setting despite his violent history. Cannon's mother testified during his trial that Clark had come at him with a knife because she was tired of people leaving her. Despite claims of ineffective defense and jurisdictional issues, Cannon's conviction and capital punishment were affirmed by the courts. His case will now go before the pardon and parole board as he seeks clemency. However, his scheduled ending date looms, set for July 20th, 2023, at the Oklahoma State Penitentiary. There's a dispute as to who attacked whom first. There is Members of the Oklahoma Coalition to abolishing for clemency saying Cannon was not allowed a fair trial back in 1995. He had, in representing himself, a decision that I don't agree with um, in post-conviction and in federal habeas. He was not allowed the typical funding for investigators, I'm seeing reconstruction expert. Activists argue the death penalty is not the right form of justice for Cannon's case. A man who killed what, 189 people in Oklahoma City, not a man who defended himself. After she never showed up to pick her young daughters up from daycare. At the time, Cannon was serving prison Clark's Tulsa home, where he's accused of beating and stabbing Clark to death. Cannon says he acted in attorneys say police found Clark on the bathroom floor with several stab wounds to her neck and say a blood self-defense. The ending and loss of human life was never desired a trail from her bedroom showed she had been in a violent fight for her life. And despite having yielded or premeditated, I defended my life. In today's clemency hearing, Clark's a time for a separate assault and escaped while taking part in a prison work program. Number 13, Charles Lorraine. Charles Lorraine's impending ending at the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility near Mansfield has been marked with a prolonged and tumultuous journey. Convicted for the brutal slaying of 77-year-old Raymond Montgomery and 80-year-old Doris Montgomery on May 5, 1986, Lorraine has spent an agonizing 36 years on Ohio's row awaiting his fate. Initially, Lorraine's connection to the Montgomerys was innocuous. He had been hired to perform odd jobs around their Warren, Ohio home. However, on that fateful day in 1986, Lorraine hatched a sinister plan. He lured Raymond upstairs, claiming to have forgotten something, only to ambush him with a butcher's knife, knifing him relentlessly in the back. Descending to the lower level, Lorraine confronted Doris, who was bedridden. Ignoring her vulnerability, he subjected her to a barrage of nine merciless knifings. Raymond and Doris both succumbed to their grievous wounds, leaving behind a devastated community. Following the census slangs, Lorraine callously burglarized the Montgomery residents before heading to a nearby bar. Driven by a twisted bravado, he boasted about slaying two defenseless old people while reveling in ill-gotten drinks. Accompanied by a friend, Lorraine further descended into a spree of lawlessness, breaking into another home to steal money and a car. Brazenly, they returned to the Montgomery house ransacking it for additional cash, jewelry, and even a firearm before nonchalantly venturing out for breakfast. It was not until the following day, May 6, 1986, that the wheels of justice began turning. Lorraine voluntarily walked into the police station on an unrelated matter, but eventually confessed to the grisly slayings of Raymond and Doris Montgomery. His admission, backed by overwhelming evidence, led to his conviction by a jury and subsequent capital punishment. Yet the road to Lorraine's ending has been marred by ongoing challenges surrounding ending protocols and drug acquisition. Governor Mike DeWine has consistently issued reprieves, resulting in rescheduled ending dates. The March 15, 2023 ending date was pushed back to May 13, 2026, further prolonging the closure sought by the grieving families of the victims. Number 12. Gerald Pizzuto the impending ending of Gerald Ross Pizzuto Jr. in Idaho has sparked a heated legal battle and raised concerns about the state's rush to carry out the capital punishment of a terminally ill inmate. Pizzuto, who has late-stage bladder cancer and has been under hospice care since 2019, is scheduled to be executed by lethal injection on December 15th. Pizzuto's conviction dates back to 1986 when he was found guilty of brutally killing Berta Herndon, 58, and her nephew Del Herndon, 37 during an armed robbery near Macal. Armed with a 22 caliber rifle, Pizzuto approached their cabin, biting their wrists and legs before subjecting them to a vicious attack. Another man, James Rice, fatally shot Del Herdon in the head. 
Despite Bizzuto's deteriorating health, Idaho officials have pursued a capital punishment warrant, drawing criticism from his attorneys. They argue that unresolved legal challenges and the urgency to execute him between Thanksgiving and Christmas demonstrate a reckless disregard for the well-being of the ending team and prison staff. Pizzuto's legal representation, the Federal Defender's Services of Idaho, has sought a stay of ending based on several pending legal challenges. They contest Republican Governor Brad Little's rejection of the Idaho Commission of Pardon and Parole's recommendations to commute Pizzuto's capital punishment, allowing him to pass away naturally in prison. Additionally, they challenge the use of pentobarbital in the ending protocol, asserting that it poses a risk of torture for a man suffering from cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. Pizzuto's medical history and prescribed medications make him more susceptible to a painful heart attack before sedation. The defense argues that the state's haste in executing Pizzuto aims to prevent thorough legal consideration of the lawfulness of his ending. They implore Governor Little to accept the commission's recommendation and spare Pizzuto, the prison staff, and the public from what they perceive as an unnecessary and avoidable ending. Pizzuto has previously evaded three scheduled ending dates during his lengthy tenure on Roe. The state's most recent attempt to execute him in June of the previous year was halted when the Commission of Pardons and Parole agreed to review his case. As the legal battle unfolds and the ending date draws nearer, the fate of Gerard Ross Pizzuto Jr. hangs in the balance, while the ethical implications of executing a terminally ill inmate continue to be fiercely debated. Number 11. Anibal Canales Jr. Anibal Canales Jr., a 58-year-old inmate on row, was set to be executed for the slaying of fellow inmate Gary Dickerson in July 1997. However, his ending date was withdrawn, granting his lawyers more time to prepare his case and seek additional evidence. Canales had been serving a 15-year sentence for aggravated physical attack when he became involved with the Texas Mafia prison gang. The gang ordered Canales and other members to kill Dickerson after suspecting him of informing authorities about their smuggling activities. Canales had Dickerson down while another gang member strangled him. Canales' attorneys argued that he was coerced into participating in the slaying due to the gang's influence and his vulnerability caused by previous heart attacks. During Canales' trial, his lawyers failed to present crucial details about his upbringing and the hardships he endured. It was revealed years later that he had suffered from physical and physical attack through his formative years. At the age of six, Canales tried to protect his younger sister from their stepfather's physical attack. His stepfather, Carlos Espinoza, subjected Canales to regular beatings, leaving him with welts and bruises all over his body. Canales also faced violence outside his home, being forced to join a gang at the age of eight. He experienced multiple instances of being shot at and knifed, leading him down a destructive path of alcoholism and drug addiction. Canales has argued that his trial attorneys were ineffective for failing to present this evidence during the sentencing phase. Despite efforts to be resentenced based on his traumatic childhood and coerced participation in the slaying, various judges have denied his request. However, some judges, including Judge Patrick Higginbotham, believe that presenting this evidence could have influenced jurors to choose a life sentence over the capital punishment. Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor criticized the court's refusal to review Canales' case, stating that juries should have a complete understanding of the defendant as a unique individual before making the decision to end their life. Canales' sister Elizabeth, who had tried to protect as a child, could have provided valuable insights into his character had the courts allowed her testimony. As the ending date loomed, the postponement granted Canales a temporary reprieve. It offered his legal team an opportunity to delve into the flaws of the initial investigation and prosecution surrounding the 1997 slaying. The hope remains to shed light on the circumstances that shaped Canales' life and ultimately spare him from the ultimate punishment. Number 10. Ramayel Saul Holt Ramayel Saul Holt, an American career criminal, gained notoriety for the slaying of New Kensington police officer Brian Shaw. Holt had a history of criminal offenses, including firearms, possession, and drug charges. In 2012, he was sentenced two to four years in state prison for drug-related crimes in Pittsburgh. The tragic event unfolded on November 17, 2017 when Officer Shaw conducted a routine traffic stop. A struggle ensued between Holt and Shaw, 
leading to Holt fleeing on foot with Shaw in pursuit. In the pursuit, Shaw was shot near the 1200 block of Leishman Avenue at 8.07 p.m. Despite being rushed to Allegheny Valley Hospital, Shaw was pronounced lifeless. Four days later, on November 21, 2017, Holt was apprehended by law enforcement. A joint effort involving the FBI, U.S. Marshals, Allegheny County Police, and the Pittsburgh SWAT team surrounded Holt's residence in Hazelwood. He surrendered peacefully, and the handcuffs used on him belonged to Officer Brian Shaw. In 2019, a Westmoreland County jury recommended the capital punishment for Holt after convicting him of first-degree slaying of a law enforcement officer. This decision was upheld by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, confirming the demise sentence. Holt's role as a passenger in the vehicle during the traffic stop and his act of shooting Shaw while attempting to escape were crucial elements of the case. Westmoreland County District Attorney Nicole W. Zaccarelli expressed the importance of justice being served in accordance with the jury's verdict and upheld by the Supreme Court. The Shaw family, devastated by the loss of Officer Brian Shaw, found solace in his heroism and the enduring legacy he left behind. Ever forget, certainly those living in New Kensington, that tonight Officer Shaw was shot by Ramal Holt. The jury recommended the death sentence. Judge Reader Hathaway made it official. The New Kensington man convicted late would make no statements before Judge Rita Hathaway pronounced sentencing. Hathaway telling Holt essentially... Um, people in Pennsylvania are not put to death, but that can change. But uh, the main thing is, is the automatic... New Kensington police officer Brian Shaw, who was just 25 years old at the time. Justice to be served. It's a day the Shaw family has been waiting on for two years. Brian's brother Stefan and Shaw, a jury unanimously sentenced him to death. A long and exhausting two years. You shoot Officer Shaw. You, you want to say anything wrong? to the family? Number 9. Andre Thomas In the depths of Grayson County's row, a battle rages over the fate of Andre Thomas. A district judge, recognizing the gravity of the situation, withdrew Thomas's impending ending date. But this isn't a typical stay of ending. Thomas is blind and his legal team argues he is mentally unfit to face the state's lethal injection. Judge Jim Fallon, presiding over the 15th Judicial District, has granted Thomas' defense team a lifeline, ordering them to present a compelling case by July 5th. Maureen Levine, Thomas's attorney, speaks of the threshold showing necessary to demonstrate his client's lifelong mental illness, plagued by haunting hallucinations that distort his thoughts and actions. But the clock is ticking, and the stakes couldn't be higher. The haunting tale began in 2004, when Thomas was arrested for the brutal slaying of his estranged wife, their young son, and her infant daughter. As investigators closed in on him, Thomas didn't resist. He confessed, claiming he was driven by divine instruction. It was a chilling revelation that would set the stage for a legal battle like no other. Now a clemency petition is in motion, urging Governor Greg Abbott and the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles to commute Thomas's sentence or at least determine his competence for ending. Dozens of mental health professionals and over 100 faith leaders across Texas have rallied behind the cause, their letters echoing a desperate plea for mercy. But it's not just Thomas's mental state that sends shivers down the spine. In a shocking display of self-destruction, he gouged out his own eyes while in custody. The act, a grotesque manifestation of his troubled mind, seems to amplify the desperate need for a thorough assessment of his mental competence. Will the court be swayed by the gruesome aftermath of Thomas's darkest moments? As the legal drama unfolds, Thomas's case has ignited a fierce debate over the intersection of severe mental illness and capital punishment. A proposed bill aims to protect defendants with such conditions from the gallows, ensuring life without parole instead. However, the legislation's reach falls short, unable to retroactively influence Thomas's fate or that of others already sentenced. In this harrowing chapter of Andre Thomas's life, the fight for his survival intensifies. With time slipping away, his defense team must craft a narrative that pierces through the darkness and persuades the court to spare his life.
The courtroom becomes the battleground where justice and mercy clash in a life for end struggle that will define the fate of a blind man haunted by his own mind. Number 8. Anthony Sanchez Anthony Castillo Sanchez, a row inmate in Oklahoma, is set to be executed on September 21, despite maintaining his innocence. In an exclusive interview with Newsweek, Sanchez emphatically stated, I'm not a killer. The crime that put him on row dates back almost two decades ago when 21-year-old ballerina Jewel Julie Buskin was abducted, physically attacked, and shot in the back of the head. Her body was found near Lake Stanley Draper in southeast Oklahoma City. For years, the case remained unsolved until DNA recovered from Buskin's clothes connected Sanchez to the crime in 2004. Sanchez insists that he had nothing to do with Buskin's slaying and claims that he felt like he was living a nightmare when he was charged with the crime. He asserts that his trial attorneys failed to check his alibis and verify his whereabouts during the time of the slaying. Sanchez believes he was made to look like a monster during the trial, forced to wear leg shackles and handcuffs throughout. His current attorneys have presented an appeal, suggesting that his late father, Thomas Glenn Sanchez, was the actual killer. They have submitted a sworn declaration from Charlotte Beatty, Sanchez's senior's former girlfriend, stating that he did confess to killing Buskin multiple times. However, the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals rejected the claim, citing the allegations as hearsay. Sanchez and his advocates argue that the DNA evidence was manipulated and erroneous, calling for a retesting of the original sample. They also point out that other evidence, such as fingerprints and hair taken from Buskin's vehicle, was not matched to Sanchez. Nevertheless, the Attorney General of Oklahoma, Genter Drummond, maintains that the evidence overwhelmingly points to Sanchez as the perpetrator. As the ending date looms, Sanchez expresses mixed emotions. He hopes that people will help prove his innocence, but has experienced multiple appeals that just resulted in disappointment. Sanchez believes that his case has not received the same level of attention as that of Richard Glossop, another row inmate in Oklahoma, and feels that race may be a factor in the discrepancy. Advocates and activists are rallying behind Sanchez, demanding a reinvestigation of his case and urging lawmakers to intervene. Despite the mounting support, Sanchez remains scared as he faces the prospect of dying for a crime he claims he did not commit. The campaign to stop his ending is set to launch at the Oklahoma State Capitol, with advocates emphasizing the urgency and importance of treating Sanchez's case with the same seriousness as others. They also say there's no documentation that Gilchrist touched this. We reached out to Julie's family, but we did not hear back. By Sanchez's team, they also cite a former Oklahoma City Police Department chemist who was later fired. But Sanchez's team says the inmate's father confessed to the killing. Number seven, Aaron Gunches. Aaron Gunches, a convicted slayer, was scheduled to be executed on Thursday night in Arizona. However, his ending has been slayed for the least two months while the courts decide if the state is prepared to carry out the capital punishment. Governor Katie Hobbs has stated that she intends to execute Gunches, but only when the proper procedures are in place. Gunches' victims argued in court that this delay is denying them their rights to prompt and final conclusions. Attorneys for the state expressed condolences to the victims, but emphasized that executing Gunches at this time would enroach on the executive branch's authorities. They argued that the state prosecute crimes on behalf of the entire system, and that the governor, executive, and department have the authority and discretion to ensure the lawful, effective, and humane ending of the capital punishment. However, Gunches himself has waived many of his appeals and has repeatedly requested to be put to demise. He filed his own capital punishment warrant and expressed a desire for his sentence to be carried out as quickly as possible. The warrant issued by the Arizona Supreme Court expired at midnight, and state officials stated that they would seek a new one once the Department of Corrections Rehabilitation and reentry fixes its ending protocols. Good evening, guys. Yeah, the court hearing today lasted for about an hour. You heard from both sides the plan. Execution day for a death row inmate, Aaron Gunches. But a legal battle has taken center stage instead after the governor. So tonight, Governor Katie Hobbs says her administration will not proceed with an execution next month. Gunches, can you get some reaction to the court issuing that warrant? Um, I, uh, I'm this, this case now. But there's also a part of me that says this is a pretty serious matter. It involves this court is that there should be an execution 
and it's it's simply moot once the warrant goes away tonight. Gunchess has been on row since 2008 for the first degree slaying of his girlfriend's ex-husband, Ted Price. He was linked to the crime when he was pulled over near the California border and shot an Arizona Department of Public Safety officer, whose bulletproof vest and wristwatch deflected the bullets, providing evidence against Gunches. Despite Gunches' request to withdraw his warrant due to concerns over the state's ending procedures, the warrant was still issued. Governor Hobbs, however, stated that the state does not seek to carry out an ending at this time. The victims challenged this and requested a fact-finding hearing to determine if the state is prepared for an ending and if the governor has exceeded her authority. Superior Court Judge Frank Moskowitz, without an active warrant, expressed his limited power in the matter and his skepticism about the case. He called for further briefs from both sides and set a hearing date for late June, acknowledging the seriousness of the constitutional issues involved. The next day, the governor said, I'm not going to do it. It's not going to happen. Fires at midnight, leaving the judge in a tricky situation. The claim that they've presented to this court is that there should be... tips who are the attorneys representing the victim's family whom Gunch is killed and also the defense. And then, of course, our contention is, is that that, in doing so, violates the law. Number 6. David Sneed David Allen Sneed, a 61-year-old man, was scheduled to be executed on April 19, 2023, in Ohio for the slaying of Herbert Rowan in 1984. Sneed spent 36 years on row. Raised in poverty and neglected by his parents, Sneed had a troubled upbringing and a history of encounters with the police. At the time of the crime, Sneed worked as a pimp, and 19-year-old Chevette Brown was one of his escorts. On the fateful night, Sneed and Chevette convinced Herbert to give them a ride, but instead directed him to a deserted alleyway. Sneed demanded Herbert's money and jewelry, and when Herbert refused, Sneed shot him in the head. Chevette also shot Herbert at Sneed's command. They took the body to Sneed's home, where they prepared it by placing it in a garment bag and tying a cement block to it. With Sneed's brother, they drove to a bridge and attempted to dispose of the body, but it landed on the riverbank. Both Sneed and Chevette were arrested and charged. Chevette accepted a plea deal and was sentenced to life in prison. Sneed's trial was postponed initially due to his incompetence to stand trial, but after receiving drug treatment, his competency was restored. During the trial, Chevette and Sneed's brother testified against him, leading to his conviction and capital punishment. However, Sneed's ending was repeatedly delayed due to issues in obtaining lethal injection drugs and the COVID-19 pandemic. Eventually, on January 31, 2022, his sentence was commuted to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The Stark County Court of Common Pleas ruled that Sneed had a serious mental illness, schizoaffective disorder, at the time of the crime, making it illegal to execute him under Ohio law. Thus, David Adlin Sneed, after spending decades on row, had his sentence reduced to life in prison due to evidence of his mental illness at the time of the slaying. Number 5. Ivan Cantu Ivan Cantu, a man who has spent over two decades on row in Texas, had his scheduled ending canceled following a new appeal that raised serious doubts about his conviction. The appeal argued that Cantu was wrongfully convicted based on false testimony from two key witnesses, as well as the withholding of crucial evidence during his trial. Cantu was convicted in 2001 for the slaying of his cousin James Mosqueda and Mosqueda's fiancée Amy Kitchen in Dallas. Prosecutors relied heavily on forensic evidence and the testimony of Contu's fiance, Amy Bosher, to establish his guilt. Mosqueda's car was found at Contu's apartment the day after the bodies were discovered, and police later discovered bloody pants and socks in Contu's trash that matched the victim's DNA. Additionally, the slaying weapon with Contu's fingerprint on the magazine was found at a friend's house. He was convicted of killing his cousin and his cousin's fiance in 2000. Comes after a new after I, after I got arrested and I came to prison, their their name was you know synonymous for for being involved. The interesting thing is that if, if this can happen to me, it can happen to anybody. You know, the, the majority of we have discovered documents that shows initially before my trial they were going to test evidence. Uh, the more I looked into, the more the case kind of started to. Told Fox 4 News in November 2000. Officers believe that the crime occurred because a robbery was the motive. And I evaluated borrowers' potential to determine whether or not they qualified for a home loan. Um, Long. Um, 
but no one ever under no one ever figured that out until about 2019 when I started this case. However, Kantu maintains his innocence and claims that he was framed. According to his appeal, Kantu argued that Mosqueda, a local drug dealer, was likely killed by a rival drug dealer to whom he owed a significant amount of money. Kantu and Bochier were out of town in Arkansas when the bodies were discovered. In a phone call recorded by the police, Kantu mentioned being threatened by a man dressed as a pizza delivery man who was looking for Mosqueda, indicating his innocence. Kantu's lawyers raised several concerns about the prosecution's case. They highlighted inconsistencies in Bosher's testimony, such as her claim that Kantu had proposed to her with a stolen diamond engagement ring when witnesses attested that they had announced their engagement earlier. Furthermore, they questioned the credibility of the evidence, including the discovery of bloody clothes in the trash can, which a police officer initially failed to find during a welfare check. One significant development in Kantu's behavior was the recanted testimony of Bocher's brother Jeff, who had originally testified against Kantu. He later admitted to being under the influence of drugs during his interaction with the police and trial, stating that his statements were untrue. The appeal has gained support from some of Kantu's original jurors, who now doubt his guilt and have called for a full hearing to reconsider his case. However, it remains uncertain whether the arguments will be heard in court, as the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals has yet to rule on the appeal's admissibility. In the midst of these legal battles, Kantu's mother, Sylvia Kantu, has been tirelessly advocating for her son's innocence. She blames inadequate defense attorneys and misconduct by prosecutors and police for his plight. Despite the challenges, Kantu holds on to hope that justice will prevail and that the outcome will work in his favor. The judge's decision to withdraw the capital punishment warrant has provided a temporary reprieve, leaving Kantu on roll while the case undergoes further review. Putting details that the that the cops had and kind of putting those into her statement to, to make her, her statements and on the witness stand, that Ivan had stolen James Rolex watch. And uh, I said, oh, Ivan, congratulations. I was arrested on November 8th. But prior to that, my, my cousin's body was discovered on the 4th. And during, um, I immediately contacted my mother and spoke with some family members and at that point ma made arrangements to, to get back to Dallas. Number four, Philip Hancock. Philip Hancock, a 59-year-old man, was scheduled to be executed on May 4th, 2023 in McAllister, Oklahoma, for the slayings of Robert Jett and James Lynch in 2001. However, his ending has been rescheduled to November 30th, 2023. Hancock has spent the last 21 years on row. Hancock's upbringing was marked by an abusive biological father, but he had a loving stepfather. At the age of 18, he was convicted of manslaughter, serving two and a half years in prison. He claimed self-defense in that case, and he had other felony convictions. Outside of prison, he worked in construction. On April 27, 2001, police responded to a report of gunshots and discovered Robert Jett injured in his backyard. Inside Robert's home, James Lynch was found lifeless. Drugs and drug paraphernalia were found at the scene. The shooter had fled. A witness named Sean Tarp provided a description of the shooter and his vehicle but didn't know his name. After about 13 months, a private attorney approached the police and implicated Philip Hancock in the slayings. At the time of the crime, Hancock was already in prison, where a gun belonging to Robert was confiscated from him. When questioned by the police, Hancock confessed to killing Robert and James, but claimed self-defense. Sean testified that Hancock had been at Robert's house on the night of the slayings. A fight broke out between Robert and Hancock, and Sean took refuge in a bedroom. She heard gunshots and Robert pleading for his life. When she eventually emerged, she found Hancock waiting for her. He apologized and allowed her to live, instructing her to not watch him leave. The rescheduling of Hancock's ending came at the request of Oklahoma Attorney General Genter Drummond, who sought more time between endings due to staffing shortages and the time-intensive nature of ending preparations within the Department of Corrections. As the new ending date looms, Philip Hancock's fate remains uncertain, and the legal and logistical challenges surrounding his case continue to unfold. Number 3. Gerald Hand Gerald Hand, a 74-year-old man, was originally scheduled to be executed on May 17, 2023 at the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility for the slayings of Jill Hand and Walter Lonnie Welch in 2002. However, his ending has been rescheduled to June 17, 2026. 
Gerald has spent the last 18 years on row in Ohio. Gerald's troubled past includes allegations of growing up in an abusive home, but he later joined the army. He had no criminal record and was known for his community volunteering. Gerald owned a radiator shop in Columbus where Walter Welch occasionally worked. He also had other employees. Gerald's first wife, Donna, was found strangled to demise in their home in 1976. Gerald received insurance payouts and compensation following her demise. A year later, Gerald married his second wife, Lori, who was also found strangled in the same home. Gerald received further insurance payouts. Despite police investigations, both slayings remained unsolved. Gerald went on to marry Glenna Castle and later Jill, his fourth wife. Financial problems with over $218,000 in debt strained his relationship with Jill, who discovered some of the debt was in her name. Gerald eventually sold his shop and worked as a security guard for minimum wage. Walter Welch began discussing a plan to kill Jill, claiming he had killed Gerald's first wife. Welch repeatedly asked for a pistol and spoke about the payment Gerald promised him for the slaying. On January 15, 2002, Gerald reported a home invasion, saying his wife had been shot and he had shot the intruder in self-defense. Police found Jill shot multiple times, and Gerald pursued and shot a masked intruder, later identified as Welch. Investigation revealed Gerald's financial troubles and the large insurance payouts he would receive upon Jill's demise. Police connected Gerald and Welch, with evidence suggesting Welch sought more money from Gerald. Gerald was arrested, charged, and convicted for both slayings, receiving a capital punishment for each. Number 2. Richard Glossop Richard Glossop, a row inmate in Oklahoma, was convicted of arranging the 1997 slaying of motel owner Barry Van Treese. Prosecutors claimed that Glossop promised a motel handyman, Justin Sneed, $10,000 to carry out the killing. However, doubts have emerged about Glossop's involvement. Heard back from either. However, after a recent hearing, family members said they believe Glossop is guilty. One of the prosecutors, literally, we have it in writing, that she tried to change the testimony of the actual. She says they visit every week without fail, and today was supposed to be their last contact visit. The U.S. Supreme Court stays the execution of death row prisoner Richard Glossop less than two weeks before. This case has drawn support from both sides of the death penalty debate. Tonight, my exclusive interview with Richard Gl Recent investigations and inmate interviews suggested that Sneed acted alone robbing Van Trees for drug money. Moreover, a memo revealed collaboration between the trial prosecutor and Sneed's lawyer, raising concerns about a fair trial. Glossop's case has attracted widespread attention and support. Advocates argue that there was insufficient evidence for his conviction and questioned the validity of the capital punishment. State lawmakers, celebrities like Kim Kardashian and even Oklahoma's attorney general have voiced concerns whose case has drawn support from state's Republican Attorney General. Supreme Court halts execution of Oklahoma death row inmate Richard Glossop. Calling for a new trial or intervention by the Supreme Court. Despite multiple delays and appeals, Glossop has now been on row for almost 25 years. His ending has been rescheduled eight times since 2015. The recent stay granted by the Supreme Court provides a temporary reprieve as they consider whether to review the case, recognizing the gravity of the situation and the potential for irreparable injustice. Made to police never included me in anything. I was never included until me and him put that thought in his mind. I mean, this is a case where literally uh, the prosecution team has tried to hide everything that they've done. <laughs> yeah, it's yes. awesome. Awesome. I tell you, we, we thought they would do it. Oklahoma is fine. We are thrilled that this that, that the court granted this day of execution. This is something that we've been asking for. Uh Number one, Cleveland Jackson. In a tragic and horrifying incident, Cleveland Jackson, along with his half-brother Jeronique Cunningham, committed a heinous crime that shook the community. In 2002, at an apartment on Eureka Street, they carried out a robbery that turned fatal. During the robbery attempt, 17-year-old Lenisha Williams and 3-year-old Jayla Grant lost their lives in a senseless act of violence. The ruthless act also left eight other individuals wounded from the gunshot wounds inflicted by Jackson and Cunningham. While Cunningham received a life sentence for his involvement, Cleveland Jackson has been awaiting his ending on row for over two decades. The recent delay in his ending date, moving it to July 2026, 
has once again put justice on hold for the victims and their grieving families. And that's all for today, folks. We'll see you next time.